Uh, my name is Nina. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Isma Volich. Professor Volich is a professor of mathematics at Wellesley College, where he has taught since 2006. He received a BA from Boston University and a PhD from Brown University. His research is in algebraic topology, and more specifically, in applications of calculus of functors to spaces of embeddings and immersions. He is the author of over 30 articles and two books, and he has delivered more than 200 lectures in some 20 countries. He was a visiting prof professor at MIT, Louvain-la-Neuve University, excuse me, Louvain-la-Neuve University, and the University of Virginia. Professor Volich was born in Sarajevo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and came to the U.S. in 1991 to attend his senior year of high school. Soon after he arrived, a war broke out in his country, and he has lived in the U.S. ever since. He now travels to Bosnia, Herzegovina frequently through his involvement in various education and research activities, including advising PhD students and working with government agencies to bring quality STEM education to the country. In 2018, he spent a semester at the University of Sarajevo as a U.S. Fulbright Scholar. Professor Volich likes to teach across the undergrad math curriculum, advise student research, and advocate for mathematics as a relevant and vibrant topic. He has recently started a number of initiatives aimed at improving the education on the role of mathematics in democracy and teaches summer workshop and a math class, uh, Math 1 to 3, at Wellesley on this topic. He was always impressed by the mission and the impact of, Wells of Albright Institute and is very excited that his work on mathematics and politics intersects with the interests of Albright Fellows. Please join me in welcoming Professor Volich. Thanks so much for the wonderful introduction. I know it's after lunch, and the title of the talk has math in it. <laughs> but I promise it'll be, it'll be math light. <laughs> and let me just reiterate, I have been a fan of this institute ever since its inception. I've been looking for an excuse to sort of come here and sort of be a part of it. So I finally tricked Stacy into inviting me. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> several people. I was the seventh <laughs> choice. <I know. laughs> Thank you for having me. So let me, let me just uh, tell you what this is sort of about, right? So there is more and more technology out there, and more and more math and statistics can be done faster and on a larger scale. So it only makes sense that more math appears in all spheres of our life, including politics as well, right? So there are some things that are political, that are governed by, by you know, non-quantifiable things like, I don't know, ethics and, and, and moral codex or commu communal issues, et cetera. But there's a ton that really is amenable to sort of math analysis, right? If you think about tax laws, economy, healthcare, I mean, you can, you can break these things down in a very mathematical way, right? Furthermore, more and more, you hear things like, you know, you're just throwing these numbers and stats at you, right? Of the sort, ex-immigrants are crossing the border, right? Or Planned Parenthood spends so many, so much money on abortions, right? The goal often of these things that you that you hear is to elicit a certain kind of emotional response upon which the math itself doesn't matter at all, right? It's not about the math, it's about the emotion that follows the math. Well, so What's happening is that math is kind of coming to the forefront because of this. There is more and more of it. And to me, an indication when something is becoming really relevant is when it appears in comedy shows. Okay, so I'm going to give you two examples. Do you know the show Veep? Does anyone watch Veep? No. All right. So Veep is basically has, its bread and butter is like beating the carcass of American politics. All right? <laughs> so there's this character. Jonah Ryan, who is like the composite of everything that's bad with American politics, and he's also really stupid. So, he, so he, someone tells him that the numbers that we use are actually Arabic numerals, and he is livid. He, so, so he goes, he goes so he is a, he's at a rally afterwards. He's like, math was created by Muslims. What is going on? Let's, we gotta ban this Sharia math. <laughs> Right? And he leads the, this rally in the chant, no more math. Right? So, the, so here's another example. 
This is uh, Kate McKinnon on Saturday Night Live playing Elizabeth Warren, right? So she's at the Iowa, Iowa um, town, town hall or something, right? And someone says, you know, can you please show us more details, more math on your uh, Medicare for all? And she just like breaks under this giant smile, this gleaming smile, like finally someone asked her about the math that she's been working on so hard. And she reveals this board, which is this like jumble of math, right? And she says, do you understand this? So I do. <laughs> I could explain it to you, but you die. <laughs> and the third instance that was sort of interesting to me of math really sort of coming to the fore forefront of politics is this guy, right? Anybody know who this is? Andrew Yang, right? He's one of the Democratic candidates for, for, for the for presidency, and he is still in it. You know, like Cory Booker quit today even, <laughs> right? So, and he's still in it. It's kind of surprising. So he has, this pin, he has this pin that says math, and he sells these hats that say math on it, etc. And he calls himself the Asian guy who's good at math. It's like one of, the, one of the many ways you could be polar opposite of Trump, basically, right? And I think he was <laughs> just saying math was kind of, it didn't pull well, so he had to come up with a thing for which math would be an acronym. So he came up with this, which is, which is horrible. I don't know who his PR team is, but, but he's got he's to change them, <laughs> right? Make America think harder. <laughs> All right, so math, math, is, math can sort of do a number of things to us, right? So it can fool us, it can rouse us, right? That's the VEEP example. By the way, a VEEP example is, t is, you know, there's this war on logic and reason that's going on currently, right? And VEEP takes it a step further. This VEEP says, you know, like, let's just eliminate all logic from all discourse. How do we do that? Let's just eliminate math as the foundation of all logic and of all rational thought, right? That's the, that's the place that VEEP takes this issue. It can alienate us, right? There is good math that's used for good policy. But people just shut themselves off when confronted with, with, you know, rigorous, hard math. Either way, math has certain power over us. And when something has power over us, it becomes a political tool. All right? That's a theorem. <laughs> right? So in a sense, you can say, you know, if you control the math, whatever that means, you kind of control the politics in, in many aspects of politics. We play right into that, and we rarely question the math that is presented to us. Either shut ourselves off, or react to it on an emotional level, and that's about it, right? We don't scrutinize it mathematically. And that, I believe, is detrimental to effective citizenship. And it's especially important today. Right? Problem is, one of the problems is that there is really no education whatsoever on this intersection of math and politics. It does not exist, especially in K through 12 education. If we had it, a goal of it would be to enable people to do various things mathematically and qualitatively and participate in political process in a rigorous way. Identify political issues that are sort of mathematical in nature, uh, invest, scrutinize them quantitatively, recognize when mathematics is being used in a manipulative way, right? And change political system based, based on understanding the math that governs certain political processes. I'll give you examples in a second. So when, I, when you say math and politics, that could be a couple of things, all right? To mathematicians, certainly, like me, it means two different things, at least two things. So let me tell you about the first one briefly, then I'll talk about the second one at, at some length. So, you could mean political quantitative literacy, or numeracy, as we call it, political numeracy. So what would that mean? So that to me means sort of facility with basic math that enables you to scrutinize sort of basic mathematical objects that are thrown at you in a political context, right? Charts, graphs, tables, statistics. Uh, some familiarity with quantitative methods that are used in politics. If you see, you know, 
a statistic in a political article or, or a political argument, you can question its validity and, and, and assess its truth, right? Here's an example of what I mean. So Senator Cruz in 2016 used this graph a lot when he campaigned for president. <laughs> so what, is there anything wrong with this? I mean, anytime you say Ted Cruz, there's everything wrong with it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but in particular, this thing, what's wrong with it? Yes. It's trying to use like yearly cycles in temperature because it changes by the season to show that this is normal. Okay. So, it's, but in which sense is it normal? That has been no change for for eighteen years and seven months. Right. <laughs> right. Does anything sound strange about that? Yeah. I have like two points. So first of all, I think that's like a tiny range to examine global warming. Like, what is 18 years? That's how long I've been alive. Exactly, right. Good. And also, I don't think it's showing the location. So depending on the location, like that, that could really change things. And if he, is he is that data like showing the average global temperatures? Right. I exactly. Don't know right. Where that? Yeah. What that is? <laughs> all. Uh, all these things are true. Like, where the hell did this come from? Like, what, what are you showing? There's no explanation, yeah. I mean, the regression line is just wrong. Like, this is... Oh, I, oh, it should be, it looks like it should be a little higher. He's for, I think he's trying to, like, you know, if we add up, like, the uh, part on top and the part on bottom, we have zero, which, like, right. doesn't work. No, it does, doesn't work. It just doesn't work, right. So, so there are, all of these things are true, right? There's lots wrong with this graph. But, you know, when you're, like, reading the paper, you come across this graph, you, like, you just move on. You're like, oh, wait, there's some, maybe there's no global warming and you're not to whatever, putting your child on a school bus, right? As I have to do <laughs> when I read the news for two minutes in the morning. Here's the problem. 18 years and seven months is a terribly specific amount of time, <laughs> all right? So this is cherry-picked data for a time interval where it starts, it chooses 1998 where El Nino was the strongest, which means the temperatures afterwards are going to be lower on average. And measurements were also cherry-picked. Okay, I'm, I don't want to get into that. The real trend is this, all right? But of course, if you zoom in on a tiny little cherry-picked interval that it goes uh, like uh, seven months, like you're going to find a period of flatness, relative flatness, right? So that is an example where, you know, ability to scrutinize data, political data, would go a long way in quickly realizing that this is just this is nonsense. This chart is nonsense, right? Here's another example. So AOC said, 21 trillion of Pentagon financial transactions could not be traced, documented, or explained. What is wrong with this? Yes. If it can be traced, then how do they make up the number? <laughs> That's a good point. If it's not there, how do you know what it is? <laughs> right? What else? She may not have the security clearance to see it. This is true. Like, where did she, where did she get the, yeah, yeah, right, exactly, right. That's true, right? <clears throat> And also, we, I'm not just from reading this, I don't know, was the denominator of like the $21 trillion? Dollar? Yeah, it's like, what is this $21 trillion? Dollar? What does this mean, right? I mean, once you get in billions, tr trillions especially, it's sort of this like meaningless stuff somehow, right? Right? And that's exactly, that's where the main problem lies. $21 trillion is, is completely unrealistically a large number, right? So. What happens is she, she might have misunderstood something that she was retweeting from, all right? 21 trillion turns out comes from sort of double and triple counting funds transferred internally within Pentagon. Like there's 300 million shuffled from here to there, and suddenly it's counted as missing here. No, it's not missing, it's, it's just been transferred, right? In fact, Pentagon hasn't spent 21 trillion in the entire U.S. history. That's how off this number is, right? It just doesn't make sense. So, Having a sense of large numbers, right, so have sort of 
understanding sort of uh, orders of magnitude in politics helps as well. Actually, the entire 2020 as budget is about 4.7 trillion. The Pentagon has 718 billion just this year, right? So just unrealistic. All right, uh, that part, it, that part of sort of math and politics, I'm not as interested in. Because I think it could be fixed fairly easily in our educational system. There are initiatives and programs in place in K-12 education that try to uh, help our or sort of kids understanding of quantitative reasoning or quantitative reasoning skills, right? The Common Core does that, I think, particularly well. There are various STEM initiatives and STEAM initiatives in schools in America that are helping kids with quantitative reasoning. So there's a good upward trend in this sense. What's missing is putting all that in a bit of a political context, like using real life data. Use, you know, current incarceration rates when you sort of, when you learn something in statistics, right? My kids who are in, fifth, in fourth and seventh grade do this kind of stuff, but the data is sort of made up. It's not relevant, right? So I think by, by cleverly infusing politics into existing quantitative reasoning initiatives, we can do a lot with this part of math and politics. You with me? Any questions so far? There's this second part that's really interesting. To me, I'm a pure mathematician. I like proving theorems and sort of talking about math in a cloud, in a vacuum, right? So I'm sort of coming down from the cloud a little bit, but I still want to keep things abstract as much as I can. So here's where, to me, the more relevant problem lies. There's math behind various fundamental democratic processes that we are not paying attention to, nor teaching ourselves or our children about. Okay? Let's do some examples. I'll show you what I mean. Voting is the number one math, mathy democratic process. So here's an example from fourth grade. Okay, it's my daughter who's 10 now. When this happened, she was nine, two months ago. Right? So good behavior in her class. So they earned one of those pajama days and watch a movie Friday or something, right? The teacher clearly had <laughs> enough of them, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> So they were going to vote on three movies, Bolt and Kerbals 2 and Coco, all right? So I said to my daughter in the morning before she went to school, I said, can you please just like write down the votes? <laughs> just remember them, write them down. <laughs> And she comes back from school and she reports that this was the tally. <laughs> All right? You may or may not agree with what the most popular movie is, but this is how they voted. This is a nine year old, right? So the class watched Bolt based on these voting results. All right? Is there anything wrong with this? Of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, not that Bolt is a terrible movie. That's, that's not what I mean. Yes? Um, it's not like the majority if you add them up or help like two stages of elections. Exactly, right. So th there's something about majority here, right? The majority did not have Bolt as first choice. See what I mean? Nine people did not like Bolt as much. Yet Bolt is now representing the entire class having won fewer than half the votes, right? So when I asked my daughter to, to tally, so we've been talking about voting and like a little math like this, with, around the, the dining room table, I mean, you can do it. And, and when it's, as, soon, as soon as I asked her to, uh, to, to report the vote, she's like, oh, you just want to see if we pick the movie that most people don't want to see. <laughs> just like, snap. <laughs> and she went up to the teacher after the teacher said that, that they should watch Bolt. And I don't quite know what transpired because <laughs> my daughter is sort of not telling me the whole story. But it, the short of it is that the teacher got mad at her. <laughs> and they watched Bolt anyway. <laughs> All right. So the problem is that we use, so what we just did here was what's called a plurality vote or first past the post. Uh, method of voting, which is 
the person who has the most votes wins. This is how we vote in most of our most important elections, primary elections in most states and presidential elections and lots and lots of other elections, gubernatorial elections, mayoral elections, all over the place. We use this person with the most votes wins. It is a ma mathematical monstrosity, the way we vote, the plurality. Vote. There are some, so the problem being a plurality winner might not be the majority winner. This creates all kinds of issues. The two most famous issues are vote splitting and spoiler effect. So let me give you a few examples of how, how this happens to sort of just, I want to drive this point home. So here's an example, kind of an extreme example. Suppose you have 11 candidates, right? One of them is considered to be a fringe candidate, crazy person, all right? And then you have 10 nice people, all right? Wonderful people, you want them to be the president, but they're very close to each other ideologically, politically, minor differences maybe. So they take the 90% of what and they, they split it evenly, right? Where, and then there's enough crazy people who vote for the fringe candidate, and the fringe candidate wins because they have more votes, right? I could have made an example where I had, you know, 99 regular candidates with 1% of vote each, and then the lunatic could win two, right? I mean, you can make, you can tweak this example to whatever extreme you want. But you see what the point is, right? Fringe candidate wins with only 10% of the votes. 90% of people don't want this people to, person to represent them, yet this person represents everybody. Okay? Let me segue seamlessly from a lunatic example to Republican primaries in 2016. There were lots of candidates. All right? Trump was regarded to be the fringe candidate. In fact, and he was, we all know, won, right? He won the plurality vote, but not the majority vote. What seems to have happened, according to polls, is that Cruz, Ruby, and Kasich split the vote, allowing Trump to win the, the primaries. If, Trump, if Cruz, Ruby, and Kasich were one person, right, they would have had, when you add these three numbers, more votes than Trump. Right? I can argue whether that would have been better or not, but... That's the math, that's what the math says. Does that make sense? Yeah. Here's an even more extreme example. This is a famous example. 1998 Minnesota gubernatorial race had three candidates. A Republican, a Democrat, and this guy. <laughs> Jesse the Body Ventura. He was a pro wrestler. Okay, <laughs> nothing against pro wrestlers running for office, right? But what happened is the Ventura got 37% of the votes and Coleman and Humphrey, Humphreys uh, split the rest, right? And Ventura won. <laughs> now what's particularly tragic about this is that exit poll shows that every, almost everyone who voted for Humphrey had Coleman as second choice, right? So if you took Humphrey votes, they really would have rather had Coleman, which means Coleman really had 62% over Ventura, right? More, 62% actually per, would have liked Coleman to have been the governor rather than Ventura. Jesse Ventura went on to be the governor. He was actually a decent governor, according to some people I've talked to. He did not seek a second term. I don't know, I just realized it's not that much fun or something, <laughs> as slamming chairs against other people's <laughs> backs or something. <laughs> Here's a... Even more famous example. 2000 presidential race. Oh, sorry. This is an example of a spoiler effect. That was, uh, that was vote splitting a second ago. This is a different kind of... This is kind of a special case of vote splitting, but you'll see why we call it spoiler effect. There were three candidates in 2000 presidential race. Bush Gore and then there's this Ralph Nader. It was from the Green Party. So I don't know if you know this famous election. It came down to... Florida's 25 electoral votes. I'm going to assume you know how this works, the electoral college and all that, right? So it came down to whoever wins Florida is going to win the presidential elections, all right? And the voting came down to these numbers. And Bush won by 537 votes, right? And this was, this was a big, 
was a big deal around this. The, the, you know, the <laughs> Gore challenges. They went to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court says, no, this is valid. There's no recount, whatever. There's this, like, dimple chad thing, and yeah, back in the old days of poking holes in, in ballots. Uh, but the thing is that most Nader supporters would have actually voted for Gore, probably. Again, polls show, right? So if you had asked those people, if Nader couldn't win, who do you want to win? They could have said Al Gore. And Al Gore is really a more realistic winner of that election. Okay. And Gore actually won the popular vote around the country by, by half a million votes. Right. All right, so I, just disclaimer, all these things that I say, like, you know, Gore would have won, if Nader voters would have gone this way and that way. This is all, this is all it's not exact science. This is based on exit polls and statistics and sort of inferences, et cetera. Uh, in fact, there's another famous election that's still debated. There's this guy, Ross Perot, who won actually a fifth of the popular vote. He won 20% of popular vote and zero electoral votes, all right? And we think that he spoiled the election for, for George Bush. But it's not, it's not clear. Right. Now, you could argue that some seven elections were decided by a spoiler effect. That's 12% of US presidential elections that could have been decided by a spoiler effect. Right. The, the person was elected president who really shouldn't have been the president. I mean, is this, you know, is this a lot? Is it acceptable? Is it okay to have a 12% error of some sort, right? If I went and bought a car and you said the brakes are going to fail 12% of the time, I don't know, would you buy it? <laughs> would you risk it? I'm, if it was really cheap, maybe. <laughs> but these things are not cheap. <laughs> All right. There, the, these kind of horrible consequences of plurality of voting occur at all levels, all over the world. So why do, we, why do we use this, right? Well, there are several reasons. It's the simplest. The framers actually said, people are stupid. We cannot give them a more complicated voting method. They're just, they, all they can handle is pick one person. This is no joke. And it has been, it's sort of entrenched now. It's been used for a long time, right? People just don't know, here's the education part. People don't know that there are better ways of voting, right? Republicans and Democrats like it. There's something called Duverger's Law, Duverger's Theorem in, in math that says it, this kind of a, a voting system favors two party systems. So what's the problem? Well, if you really break it down, you re plurality method is just asking a preference for one candidate. It's not considering how a, how a person, a voter, might regard other candidates, right? So it's incomplete information, right? So there are voting systems in which voters take the other candidates into consideration as well. These are called the ranked choice voting methods, right? And I just want to do an example with you of this and try to convince you that this is these methods contain more information, and they're not that hard to implement. Here's an example. I have 110 people voting for five candidates, A, B, C, D, E, okay? And this is, this is the tally. So this thing is called preference orders or rankings or ballots. So what this means is that 36 people went into the voting booth and they ranked A, D, E, C, B, their candidates according to that preference. They like, a better than D, D better than E, E, C, and C to B, right? Everybody see what's going on? 24 people voted this way, that's their preference. There are some rankings are missing, like A over B over D over E over C. What that just means nobody voted that way, right? Is this table clear to everyone? Right. Okay. But now I have to somehow declare who the winner is, right? So first of all, tell me, is there a, here's the same table, is there a majority winner? Who's the plurality winner? Is there a majority winner? No, to be a majority winner, you would have to have gotten, how many people did I say voted? 110? You need like 56 
votes or something, right? Nobody got 56 votes. Uh, it looks like A has got the most votes, 36, right? So A is the plurality winner. Under current voting systems, A would be declared the winner of this election, right? All right, let's do the next thing that's not as bad. It's called a runoff election, okay? So in a runoff election, you keep the two highest scoring candidates, the two candidates who got the most first place votes, and you essentially hold another election between them. This does happen quite a bit, actually. Some gubernatorial elections are done with a runoff. Some uh, state senators, uh, senate runs are done with a runoff. So it exists. A lot of countries vote with a runoff. So I'm from Bosnia. Our neighbor is Croatia. We're very sort of codependent politically, economically. Croatia just had an election. The other day, there was a runoff election. There was an election two months ago. Two candidates were did the best in that election among like seven candidates and there was another runoff election between the two winners the other day right and somebody necessarily then you'll get a majority winner if you just have two right so here you can do runoff uh right away from the table you don't need to hold a separate election right so here's how runoff works i'm going to keep two candidates who did the best who who are they a and B have the most first place votes. That means I'm going to take C, D, and E, I'm going to erase them from the table and just shift everybody up in the table, right? Pretend C, D, and E never existed. So this is what happens. You ever see how that happened? Right? So like here's B and A. I kept those, erased C, E, and D. So B is just on top of A with 20 votes. And that's here. Who's the winner now? B, 74 out of 110 votes. All right, <coughs> moving on. There's something called the instant runoff or Hare's method. It's like runoff, but a bunch of times, right? So what you do is you look at the person with the least first place votes, throw them out, retabulate, and then look at the, and then repeat basically. Let me just do it through an example. Here's our table initially. Who has the least first place votes? E, I guess, right? 12. So we're going to throw out E and, and just move everybody up into empty slots left by E, right? So now this is my table. Does everybody see what happened here? You just have to like, your eye has to not see purple basically now. You just erase purple <coughs> and shift up a few for everybody who was below E. All right, here's that table again. Who has the least number of first place votes now? D. Is that right? Yeah. All right, I remove D, I shift up, I get that. Who has the least number of first place votes now? A. No, B has fewer. So B has 32, right? Is that right? B, so B's out of there? Yes. And here, here we are. So who wins the election, the runoff election? C wins the instant runoff. Instant runoff is used, actually, Maine just voted last year to use instant runoff in all their elections. Uh, New York City voted to use instant runoff in all their elections. So do Minneapolis, San Francisco, and other cities as well. There's growing awareness that instant runoff is the, is the thing to do somehow, right? It's gaining traction. There's, but there's other ways to do this, right? Here's something called the board account. Board account... So there's a version of board account that's used by the American Mathematical Society and the Mathematical Association of America. Now, if the mathematicians use these, these methods to vote, maybe that's like, that should be a message to, <laughs> to everyone else, right? But there's arguments about this as well within the math community. So here's how I do it. If you have N candidates, you assign point value to slots, right? So if you're... If you're, if you're the top out of n candidates, you get n minus 1 points, and then n minus 2, et cetera, down to 0. So here's what I mean, right? Here's our original table. So A, do I have a thing showing this? Yeah. So A gets 4 points. So there's 5 con candidates. So if you're top, you get 4 points. A gets 36 times 4 points for being here and on top of this column, right? Then gets 0 points 24 times, 0 points 20 times, et cetera. 
So you do this, you go through column C where each candidate is, give them appropriate, appropriate amount of points, and then tally it all up. Does everybody see how this works? So here it is. If you add it all up for all the candidates, it turns out D actually has the most points. All right, just trust me that I did this right. <laughs> Don't trust me. <laughs> Let's pretend I did this right. <laughs> but, but you see how it works? It's just, it's just like adding some points. All right, D wins the board account. This guy, Kondarse, was mad at board. I said, no, this is no good. I want to give you an alternative method. Let's compare candidates pairwise, okay? And then if there's a candidate <coughs> that's preferred to all other candidates in pairwise competitions, that should be the winner, right? This, this person wins over everybody else in pairwise competitions. So let's look at our example. So for example, you compare A versus B. So you just look at A and B and look at how many times A is on top of B and how many times B is on top of A, right? And who gets the bigger number wins. That make sense? So B wins over A, because A is on top of B only 36 times in this column. But all the other columns, B is on top of A. So 24 plus 20 plus 18 plus 8 plus 4, 74. So B wins over A, right? Basically what we're doing is a bunch of little runoff elections between all possible pairs of candidates. Can anybody tell me how many runoff elections there will be with five candidates? How many times? How many times do I have to... How many times do I have to do this? How many pairs do I have to compare? It's something five choose two. Have you heard of this five choose two notation? Right. So there's only ten, right? So not too bad. So here's what happens. Uh, I, I'm going to spare you the all the ten calculations, right? But it turns out if you do this, that actually we E wins in pairwise runoffs over all the candidates. All right, so E was the Condorcet winner. See that you see what's happening here? <laughs> Not to muddy the waters, but we got a different winner with all different methods, right? That's okay, right? Every one of these methods is better than plurality. <laughs> it contains more information, right? So then you, there's a natural question, which one's the best, the fairest? Well, this is where it gets interesting mathematically, for me personally, it gets interesting. So what does fairness even mean, right? Well, it means different things to different people. It depends on what you are trying to accomplish with an election. Each one of these uh, tallying methods favors slightly different things. One favors, uh, you know, candidates who is most liked by everyone. One favors the candidate who is most centrist. One favors the candidate who is not sort of doesn't have any fringe ideas, right? So one favors sort of candidates who are you know experimental in some sense. So there, all of these methods actually can be broken down to to, to some characteristics about what they what they look for in a candidate. But now you're getting into personal choices, right? What do you think the most important criteria should be? when electing someone, right? The problem is that group, uh, that individual preferences are hard to translate into group preferences, okay? You could, all of you, if, if, if you say, you know, you prefer, I don't know, vanilla to chocolate ice cream, chocolate to strawberry, I can safely assume that you prefer, what did I say first? Vanilla to strawberry, right? Not so with groups. A group can prefer vanilla to chocolate, chocolate to strawberry, and strawberry to vanilla. Right? So this gives birth to an entire field of study called social choice theory that lives at the intersection of everything. And it's the coolest thing that you could ever imagine studying. Right? But it is not taught anywhere in our schools. A lot of this can be taught in high schools, apparently in fourth grade as well, right? This is what's missing. Basic, sort of big, big picture view is we have no social choice theory in schools, right? There are a couple of other examples of where we sort of fail at democracy, 
with math. Uh, well, let me just, let me just, uh, sorry, let me just make sure we all understand that this, the voting method does matter. Vote splitting is polar effect, we've gone over. It favors partisan ca candidates, there's something called the center squeeze effect. I've mentioned Duverger's law, favors a two-party two system, but it also uh, encourages dishonest, strategic voting. You can strategically vote against someone, not for your favorite candidate, but against someone else so your candidate wins. And there's also disenfranchisement. In, in a town next door, Lowell, there's a, big, there's a big debate about how the town of Lowell votes. Town of Lowell is about 49% underrepresented groups. Zero representation on the school committee and on the city council because of something called block voting, right? Where white people vote together in block votes, right? So there's a push to change the voting method and it looks like it's happening. And the thing I wanna point out, you can't quite see it here, but Tufts University based research group, metric geometry and gerrymandering group analyzed some options and gave a report. This is a group of mathematicians pure abstract mathematicians like myself, who are getting involved in trying to make a change because at its core, this question is mathematical, right? So I was very happy to see that, that these, uh, these people are, are in it. So it, it's not about, just about vote splitting and spoiler effect. You can actively and effectively disenfranchise with, with the stupid voting method that we have right now. Here's another example. Anybody know what apportionment is in, in, in politics? So every state has a certain number of representatives in the, in the House, right? How many representatives do you get as a state, all right? How do you figure that out? So there's a census every 10 years, and you decide what the population is. And then there's, the Constitution says, the number of seats should be proportionally apportioned among the states, all right? There are currently 453 seats in the House. This was permanently set in 1940. Why 453? I have no idea. Seems to be one of many arbitrary chunks of math that exists in our political system, all right? And here's, uh, here's how it works now. So Massachusetts has nine representatives. The delegate, Massachusetts delegation is, is nine in number, right? Uh, this is just, I just got this off Wikipedia or something. The blue and the yellow just means, in, uh, this is the numbers in 2010 as of last census. And, and yellow and blue tell you, uh, compared to 10 years before, which states have gained or lost seats, right? Because when you reassess population, if your state suddenly has a lot less population, you don't get as many representatives, you lose some, right? So there's a redistribution of the 453 seats that happens every 10 years based on census, right? But how was this decided, right? Well, so here's basically how you, how you do it. You take the population and you divide it by the number of possible seats, right? 435 seats. So you get this number, 710,000. This is really saying, ideally, each representative would represent this many people, right? This is how many people per representative. Does that make sense? Okay, so then you go to each state and then you divide the population of that state by 710,000. All right, what's that, gonna, what's that doing? Could somebody tell me what, what, we're, what this is trying to calculate? Nine people could represent seven people in the Massachusetts. That's right, you, you sort of have nine multiples of 710 in your pop Massachusetts population, right? Does that make sense? But the problem is when you divide, you don't get a whole number, you don't get an integer, right? Massachusetts should get 9.24 representatives in the Congress, right? But you can't take a representative and chop <laughs> them up into 2400s, right? <laughs> Stacy's like, yeah, you can. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you want to. <laughs> right? So what happens is that you round down, this is, this, the brackets means the floor function, you just take the integer value, you disregard the decimal. So nine is like the minimal number of representatives you should get, right? So you know, Texas gets 35, 
Okay, since you assign sort of the minimum number to each state, there are seed left. So you have an apportionment all of 453, 35, 35, 53. So what do you do with the rest? Okay, right? There are some representatives that have not been assigned. Some seats have not been assigned. This is a complicated math question that has not been resolved satisfactorily. It produces all kinds of uh, uh, paradoxes. It has caused all kinds of fights. It was, the it was the cause of the first presidential veto in US history when Washington <coughs> vetoed Hamilton's apportionment method and chose Jefferson's instead. So there's a, there's, a, there's a huge, rich, ugly history of how we apportion these votes. And they are not, all the methods that we've used so far are not mathematically sound. They have huge flaws. And in fact, if you, if you looked at any kind of history and looked at presidential elections and you assume that a different apportionment method was used, you could have actually gotten different presidential winners of presidential elections with different apportionment methods because the states would have had different number of electoral votes which are based on the, the people in the house right so there's, there's math behind this that's not it it's just baffling to mathematicians this is happening we talk about gerrymandering a little this is a very mathy Issue. Are there any questions on the apportionment part? Kind of went through it fast, yeah. Uh, if the cutoff was like from 0.5, would it, make, would it make a difference? Like let's say if it was below 9.5, you get nine seats. So this is what Hamilton proposed. Said if anybody who is a, a 0.5 or over gets one, but then, but then you run out of seats at some point. There might have been states left that also had greater than 0.5. They just didn't get, you know, just because. Uh, because they happen to be late in the alphabet, or they happen to like, you know, 9.3581 versus 9.3582, right? So the two gets it, but one doesn't. You know, it's just very arbitrary. And there was this, there's this thing that, the, the, one of the paradoxes, sorry, I'll take a question in a second. One of the paradoxes that actually occurs, it's called the Alabama paradox, is the number of, so here's what can happen with most of these methods. You can increase the number of seats in the, in the Congress, in the House, which has happened throughout history a bunch of times. When that happens, it can, it can happen that a state actually loses a seat. Makes no sense, right? You have more seats in the Congress, yet the state loses a seat. It's a paradox, right? <laughs> it's happened, Alabama paradox. So it's, it's just like there are holes upon holes in these apportionment methods that we have. Yes, sorry. Oh no, I was gonna ask, like, if increasing the number of seats proportionally to the population of the US at the time was ever considered, but you just asked answer that. To do this fairly, so this gets into the issue of how the Electoral College works, etc. To do this really fairly, you'd have to increase the number of seats for, for, to something like 1,700, which is not gonna happen. You have to triple the number of seats. Or quadruple, right? So yeah. All right, let's talk about gerrymandering, right? So those seats that we get in, in each state gets for a Congress is based on the number of districts there are in Congress, and each each district is supposed to contain about seven hundred and ten thousand people, right? And each district basically sends one member member to the House of Representatives, right? Now, in total is 435, as we, as we know already. So California has 53, that's the biggest state. That just has nine, Virginia 11. Texas is the next biggest. They have, I forget what, thir in the 38 maybe or something. But some districts have strange shape. Right. Now, the first thing I wanna say is that it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because the idea sometimes is to give, by districting, the idea is to give representation to people who may not have it otherwise, or who have similar goals, and they want to band together because of these similar goals and have a voice in Congress, right? So for example, there's a district in California that just, this is sliver along the beach, right? But you know, this might be people who, you know, live in Coast, they have similar demands in terms of tourism, urban planning, you know, like f f insurance 
protection, etc. Right? So it might make sense that they form together and, and have a representative Congress. Or there's this famous district in Chicago. So one of the stipulations that the, uh, that the Supreme Court puts on districting is that the districts have to be contiguous, they have to be connected. So this is sometimes very, <laughs> very tenuous. So the connection between these two is an actual highway. Right. But this allows these two communities of Hispanic origin to actually have representation in Congress. Right. So Voting Rights Act, one of the things that it says is that you, this should happen. Okay. So it's not always bad that district looks we districts look weird. All right. So if you try to chop up districts into just like boxes, which is your natural tendency for things to look pretty, right? Just it's kind of squares. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work because it wouldn't take into account demographics, geography. You know, maybe there's a river running through. You know, you want to divide districts according to mountain ranges or rivers, etc. <clears throat> so what the Supreme Court said early on in U.S. history is that states have the right to redraw district maps, right? And this is a problem. Federal government just has some loose guidelines. Like I said, there's the Voting Rights Act, contiguity, can't split counties and cities, can't split communities of interest. This, would, this is the Hispanic population uh, example. All right, but this power that's in states' hand to redraw districts can and is often abused, all right? In fact, the first abuse of it happened right here in Massachusetts, where Senator Gary, it's Gary, even though we call it gerrymandering, drew this district that was then made fun of in a local paper, might have been the Boston Globe, and someone said it looked like a salamander, so hence the gerrymandering or gerrymandering. That's where the name comes from. So gerrymandering, it actually allows you, allows the party in power to carve the districts so that the votes turn out in their favor. In a sense, it, it really, the, you know, the, the slogan is the party chooses the voters. It's not the voters who choose the party. That's what actually happens with gerrymandering. Here's a sample of examples of why gerrymandering actually matters. So for example, in 2012, Republicans won 61% of Wisconsin seats, state seats, but won fewer than 50% of actual votes. Ohio voted, had 12 Republicans, 4 Democrats as a delegation of the House. And this spread would have actually occurred with Republicans winning anywhere from 49 to 79% of the vote. You'd have st still 12 Republicans and 4 Democrats for that range of wins of, of Republicans. Republicans had 77% in North Carolina, but won about 50% of the votes. Uh, 2018, it was a big Supreme Court case, decided that Pennsylvania was politically gerrymandered too much and the state had to redraw its maps. After that, the number of female House representatives went from zero to four. And so on. Both par parties gerrymander, but if you look at the top 10 most gerrymandered states, seven of them are Republican, uh, Republican run, have Republican legislatures. And there are a bunch of gerrymandering cases in U.S. courts. Uh, Virginia is probably the most famous one. It's been going back and forth between Supreme Court and state, state legislature. Uh, all, Supreme Court also decided that this was too gerrymandered, and Virginia was appealing, etc. I think it's still going on. All right, so when you see really strangely shaped districts without any kind of obvious demographic need for them, something's going on. So if you zoom in on this border of a district, there is a house here that's gerrymandered. A single house lies in a different district. There should be a straight line here, but no, it goes around the house. But this is how finely gerrymandered some districts are. All right. This is also a famous district called Goofy Kicking Donald Duck District. <laughs> This tiny little point here, you remember the contiguity condition from the Supreme Court? That's a seafood restaurant. <laughs> One single tiny building is keeping this together. 
right? <laughs> so the idea is to sort of look at this mathematically, right? And teach this in schools. You can work this into your geometry class in 10th grade, no problem at all. There are some basic techniques from geometry, graph theory, data analysis, and elsewhere that can tell you, that can recognize gerrymandered districts. There are things like efficiency gap, isoperimetry, convexity, dispersion, all these things are 10th grade concepts. There's no reason why we shouldn't be teaching these things in school, all right? in high school. So, other things I could, I could talk about if I had seven more hours. We've talked, you know, we mentioned Electoral College. Electoral College is itself a mathematical aberration, all right? Uh, one can go at length about the effects that states, small states versus big states, might have or not have on presidential elections due to Electoral College. There's something, there's a beautiful uh, a story of mathematics, of power assessment. You can actually quantify power of a political party, of a coalition, of the president, of the UN Security Council, of the EU Parliament, right? So there's the math of power assessment that actually also can be taught in our schools. Uh, there's a big story about regulation of cryptography. So if you use WhatsApp or Viber, all your, all your communication is encrypted. Federal government doesn't like that because they want to be able to sort of, you know, go into your phone and see. I mean, understandably, you want to, there's a big, big, uh, big case a couple of years ago in San Bernardino, California, there was a shooting and the FBI got the iPhone from one of the shooters and they wanted to decrypt it because they thought there might be information about, you know, terrorist cells or next terrorist attack or something, right, on the phone and they couldn't. And they took Apple to court and Apple said, no, we don't want to let you decrypt. But there's a third party company that actually broke broke the encryption on the phone. So what's happening behind the scenes, this is actually a, a fascinating story. I taught a first year seminar on cryptography and privacy. What's happening is that the uh, National Security Agency and, and, and like agencies are actually trying to weaken the math itself, the crypto math that's built into the hardware of all their devices, right? So they have these things called backdoors so they can come in and and, and sort of crack your phone if they need to. So this has huge implications of privacy. This is the intersection of, of some beautiful ma mathematics governing cryptography and issues of privacy. You can talk about voter manipulation through math of networks, graph theory, right? Social media, so sort of math of social media. That's where data, big data analysis comes in. Data sciences, of course, playing a bigger and bigger role in, in all this. And then the sort of game theory, like issues of conflict, bargaining, political stability. I mean, you can, you know, there are theorems that govern what's happening in the current trade war with China, right? And we could, we could teach examples of this on some level in high school even, right? Statistics, of course, I mean, that's like endless, right? We could be teaching all the ways in which we are, you know, statistics is being misused or, or, or used inadequately in politics. So again, all of this can be taught in high school and elementary school. Let me just give you some final thoughts. Sorry, I've gone over time, but I just have, uh, there is, I'm sure you realize, this is really a time of unprecedented political, political, structurally political animosity towards fact, reason, science. We are sort of awash in, in bad math that's not only corrupting the democratic processes but also used to disenfranchise. All right. We have old inferior political processes that need to be changed. All of this is only going to happen if you and I spread the word first of all about the importance of math and politics, all right. quantitative reasoning, demand, rigor and transparency quantitative rigor in political processes, and then advocates for more education on this topic. Now is the time to do this. It turns out 27 states currently have some kind of uh, new elementary and high school civics education standards in response to the deteriorating you know, quality of the political discourse. 27 state school systems are 
appalled at what's going on. They're trying to beef up, including Massachusetts, beef up civics education standards. And now is the time to sort of insert qualitative literacy or quantitative literacy in politics as well into those standards. I think it, I think it should be and can be that. So anyway, I'm working towards, towards this and my, doing my small part. All right, thanks. <laughs>